Hey friend, I am Julie Slattery and so glad that you've joined me for an episode of Job with Julie. This podcast is a listener supported outreach of a ministry called Authentic Intimacy and we help people navigate sexual issues from a Christian perspective. You know, when most couples talk about the problems in their sex life, they talk about their spouses. Uh, they point the finger at their spouse's sex drive, maybe a lack of interest in pursuing sex, or maybe their poor communication together. And it's true that all these elements have an effect on sex within marriage, but like most things, blaming each other doesn't seem to work towards a solution. Well, today I'm going to be talking with Dr. Michael Seitzma. You've probably heard him on Job with Julie before. He always has great insight. And we're going to be talking about three sexual superpowers that can actually help change intimacy and the conflicts that most couples have within their sexual relationship. Now, I recorded this conversation with Michael when we were speaking at the same event, so you might hear a little more background noise than normal. And I think you're going to enjoy this conversation as you probably have when I've had Michael on in the past. You know, you're in for a treat with his perspective and wisdom. Well, Michael, thanks so much for being with me again on Job with Julie. Um, We are getting ready in just a day or two to do Mm -hmm. a presentation together based on your material calling Discovering Your Sexual Superpowers. Right. It's fun material. Yeah. Well, Mm -hmm. when you first kind of said, hey, let's talk about this. I'm like, that sounds really interesting. Like uh-huh. your sexual superpowers. Yep. And I guess the first question is, what does that mean? You know, we think of superpowers, you know, whether that be Superman or Wonder Woman, or it's the power to enact a change on something outside of us mm-hmm. that I have, you know, the ability to defy gravity, or I have the ability to move faster than weapons, or I have the, a, a supernatural ability to enforce my will on the world around us. Mm. And I don't believe that those are anything except fantasy. Mm. Real superpower is my ability to manage self, my ability to keep myself centered, to keep myself moving toward the vision, no matter what's going on around me. Mm-hmm. You know, if I want something and I want it for my spouse, you become the barrier to being happy, to getting what I want. Mm -hmm. So now I need to make you be different somehow. Mm -hmm. And so I'm going to pull out all manner of manipulative techniques to get you to do what I want so I can be okay. Well, in that process, I've made myself a type of a victim. I can only be okay if you are different. Mm -hmm. So we move that into the sexual talk. I want to engage in sex. I approach my spouse and they say no. They become the problem. Yeah. And I'm going to do everything I can to get them to say yes. And that's not working because the person with the least desire is always in control. That's a systemic rule. And they then feel the pressure. They know they have the power. And so they have limited options. They have the option of just caving in and complying. Well, that's not good for anybody Mm because nobody gets what they want at that point. But that's a common approach of fighting back and trying to make me not want what I want, demeaning me, diminishing me, in some way saying, you know, a a wife, um, last week, she looked at her husband and said, there's something broken and wrong in you. You are sick that you want sex. Wow. You know, and as an attempt to get him to step back and not put her under pressure for engaging with him. Or the third is they just leave. They may leave internally or they may leave physically, but I can't handle the pressure and get out. Well, that doesn't work for either the person who's asking or the person who is being asked. Mm-hmm. And and if I could just even reframe it, because I think there's something else going on here uh-huh. too. The person who has lower desire wants something as well. Yes. So it doesn't necessarily maybe want sex, but wants a husband who's more attentive or sensitive. Or, right. And so mm-hmm. that person is also using all of their energies and powers to try to get that individual to change. Right. Mm-hmm. And you have this mix of who's asking for what. And yeah. I can't be okay if you don't give me what I want. And I'm not going to give you what you want unless I get what I want. And, yeah. and it gets really icky mm-hmm. in that process. So what I want to do is flip the power back where it belongs. Mm -hmm. I want to get both to stop being a victim to this process Mm -hmm. and to step back. And and when we do, we realize we have profound superpower. Mm -hmm. We have an ability to center self and to invite, draw 
our spouse into space where we can connect. Mm -hmm. And to me, I think that's the real superpower of being able to center me, create a space that draws you, invites you in to join me. And why is it a superpower and not just power? Because I don't think people do it naturally. Mm -hmm. And I think it takes a supernatural force in order for us to do it well. Mm -hmm. You know, part of why I'm a pastor doing sex therapy is it's in these moments that that the true fork in the road shows up. Are you going to do this under your own power? Mm-hmm. Or are you going to submit and allow the Spirit of God to work through you and be who God's called you to be? Mm-hmm. You know, how do I truly be, you know, to step into one of them seduction, and I talk about being invitational. I can be invitational as a human, or I can be invitational in a Christ-like way. That is profound. And it takes me a long time to learn how to let him be in control of me, that I am truly invitational like Christ was. Mm -hmm. And that's where it becomes truly a superpower. Mm -hmm. So Um, what you're saying is, in our personality, in our will, we have some power and ability to do the things that you're going to describe, mm -hmm. but to really do them well requires the life of Christ in us. I think to do it at the level that we that truly makes a profound difference, yes. Mm -hmm. I think the other reason that it's a superpower is when it's done well, it's really tough for a spouse who cares for us to repel it mm -hmm. because it is so inviting, it's so drawing, it's so it, it's the spouse that we want to mm -hmm. have. And, and so and, we're drawn in. And I think it's important that you put that phrase, a spouse that cares about us, um, that there are some people who have incredibly hard hearts or are so wounded that they can't respond well. That is true. Um, there may be a variety of um, barriers that are there, but my experience is when somebody learns and engages all of the superpowers, those walls start to melt pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and that's the other reason why I think it's a superpower rather than mm -hmm. just a power. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, you've got three of these, so yes. we're going to unpack them, and uh -huh. we can practice for our talk on Friday. <laughs> okay. See if I can remember what the they are. The first one is curiosity. <laughs> yep. So curiosity is, you know, I think we all know what curiosity is. It's that state of being where I'm in wonder. Mm. where I am open to learning, where I want to know. I'm not trying to define something. So Karen and I call ourselves critter people. So uh, for the excursions, for example, we looked at what excursions can we do on this cruise that gets us in with critters. Mm. And I, quite honestly, I love watching her when a critter shows up. She turns into a, a little kid as she is so curious and playful and she wants to hold it and touch it. And, and that curiosity just is so present. Mm. Well, how do we stay curious about each other? How do we look and not say, you need to be this way for me, but wow, look at how you are. Mm. You know, look at what it means to be feminine. Look at what it means to be masculine to you. Mm -hmm. So it's not do, not just doing curious, but it's truly shifting our hearts to being curious. So a couple sits across the office from me on the, the love seat looking at each other, and one of them is being critical and demanding of the other which is the normal state when a couple comes in, in in crisis. And I keep working on them until they get to where they go. Um, often I'll use the what if question. Mm -hmm. What if what your spouse is saying is true? You keep telling them that it needs to be different. What if it's true for them? And all of a sudden you see it click inside and they go, wait, well, what would that mean? Mm -hmm. and, and before the spouse can answer, I go, stop right there. What is that feeling inside? You just shifted from one state to another state. You shifted from uh, hurt and criticizing and demanding a defensive, uh, aggressive state to an open, soft, curious state when you went, wait, what would it mean? Mm -hmm. That's curiosity. I want you to feel it really well because mm -hmm. I'm going to invite you back there often. Yeah. And I want you to get to where you know how to be there and I think if we can get to where we can be in that curious state when we're with our spouse, God made an amazing creature in our spouse. And to be always caught in the all that we were in early in the relationship, where we go, you're really cool. 
Mm. I want to discover all there is about you. You know, Karen and I have been married 38 years. We are not the same person that we were when, he, when we met. Um, and how do you stay curious about who you're becoming and who you are today? You mm-hmm. know, she has shifted her beliefs in many things pretty dramatically. And, and I work hard to stay curious in where she's at today, mm-hmm. even though many times I want to tell her where she should be today. Yeah. <laughs> and, I, and I think that's so key, Michael, because what gets in the way of us being curious is what you said earlier. I don't. I'm not okay with you being where you are. Uh, right. And I, I don't want to do exploration of where yep. you are. Mm-hmm. I just want you to change. I'm afraid. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Or I'm frustrated because yep. where you are is not meeting my need. Yeah. I'm afraid I'll never get that need met. Mm-hmm. And so I need to make you be different. And we shifted back into not using the superpower. I'm mm-hmm. trying to control you. And that doesn't work in the real world, only mm-hmm. in the fantasy world. Mm-hmm. Where if I step back and I'm curious, I can start to discover And if I believe in the core of who you are, I can allow myself to be curious. And that is a task. That's where I'm developing that superpower. Yeah. So you've been married 38 years. 38 years. How do you stay curious? I mean, you know her pretty well. I have to work at it. Honestly, I really have to work at it. Uh A lot of it is looking and thinking. (laughs) She looked up at me the other day and I'm, I'm looking at her eyes and all I could think of was, Dang, you're gorgeous. Mm. And I just, I, I so just want to know you, mm. you know, even after 38 years. Now, I don't always express that well. Mm-hmm. And the times that she frustrates me, I definitely don't express it well. Mm-hmm. And so how do you stay in that kind of curious state, mm-hmm. in that curious moment? Mm-hmm. I think that's the task of it. And when you are frustrated, mm-hmm. uh, if you are in a season where the ways that she's different from you is really apparent like how do you get to that back to that posture of not wanting to change her but be curious it's intentional choice Mm -hmm. it's catching yourself and choosing to be intentional and Mm -hmm. i weigh i'm not perfect at that but that's the goal how do i intentionally pause myself and go stay curious Mm -hmm. what if Mm -hmm. what if what she's saying is true what if she's revealing something what if and that allows me to go into the curious stance. Mm-hmm. Just for me, asking what if mm-hmm. allows me to shift into it. Mm-hmm. But I have to intentionally choose to go there. Mm-hmm. And I don't, that's why I think it's a superpower. It's not natural to anybody. Yeah. Um, we do know from studying the big five, the, the key aspects of, of wired in personality, that some people are more naturally curious than others. But I think even in people who are naturally naturally more curious, their DNA creates more curiosity. When it gets into intimate relationships, they're not as curious. Yeah. So I think it's something that we all have to work on. And I heard you share some research earlier that all of us pretty much want our spouse to be curious about yes. us, but we yep. don't want to be curious about them. Right. Mm-hmm. And 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 it's uh, it was kind of tricky research that I did that I asked the questions and then I collated them to show that that we believe we are more curious than our spouse is, mm-hmm. which our spouse doesn't believe we're more curious than they are. Yeah. You know, so we give ourselves the benefit of the doubt and we diminish our spouse's yeah. desire, but. This is one of those areas that there is a gender stereotypical difference that for many men tend to be more sexually curious, and their wives agree, he's more sexually curious than I am. Many women are not very sexually curious, and they acknowledge that in themselves, and the husbands agree with that. No, she's not very sexually curious. Yeah, I might be playing into this bias, but when the world is sexual curiosity? (laughs) (laughs) Well, I think it's just being curious about how you work, and Mm -hmm. what are you really after here? Yeah. Do you just want to play with my body or do you want to connect with me? Mm-hmm. You know, and I'm trying to be curious about what's going on mm-hmm. and what do you like? You know, we see women that are more curious about their own bodies and what works and, mm-hmm. and how does it work? And wow, it's just changed from last week. And rather than being hypercritical or blaming self or shutting down because it's not what they want it to be curious about, oh, look, look at how it is. Hap- As I get older, look at this, mm-hmm. you know, and the husband's staying curious as well that allows space for her to be curious Mm -hmm. but as she's curious and learns about herself if he's curious she teaches him and now we've got something that's rich together and allows him to pursue intimacy Mm -hmm. if i'm critical of you know i shouldn't be this way i shouldn't look this way or respond this way i'm never curious about what it takes for me to work Mm -hmm. for me to get aroused for me to experience a climax Mm -hmm. I think sometimes women aren't sexually curious also because we think 
wrongly that men are very simple when it comes to sexuality. There is an aspect of men that is simple, but you're right. We are really complex too, especially mm-hmm. right under the surface. Mm-hmm. And we often aren't aware of it mm-hmm. because we haven't been encouraged to go there. Nope. But a wife who is curious and asks the questions mm-hmm. and rides through us being irritated. You know, you're yeah. asking me questions. I don't want to go there, so I'm yeah. gonna I'm gonna push back. Mm-hmm. And if she can stay curious and open and invite us to go there, maybe a couple days later we'll come back and we'll start to unpack it. Now we're Mm. on a journey where we are sharing and he can explore the complexity of who he is. Because you're right, we are. Mm -hmm. And he begins to understand that sex is not just about sex, but he has needs for intimacy too. Right. That maybe he might be a little bit more simplistic in the physiological aspect. Mm -hmm. Not a lot more, but a little bit more. Mm -hmm. Seems like a lot more. But the depth of it is really profound for men. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Hey friend, I hope you're enjoying this episode and I wanted to take a quick break to let you know that our online book study groups are now open for registration and will be starting soon. If you've never heard of our OBS groups, they are online groups designed to help you dive deeper into understanding who God is and why he cares about your sexuality. Every season, we offer a wide variety of books and cover everything from singleness and sexuality to marriage to sexual sin struggles and healing. So these groups offer you this chance to connect with other people in similar seasons of life and to work through some of your unanswered questions around God and sexuality. We have seen such transformation through these groups, so I'd encourage you not to miss out. Click on the link in the show notes to sign up today. Now, the second superpower, when I first heard you say (laughs) this word, I didn't like it. Right. And it's being seductive. Yeah. And boy, I've rarely, if ever, heard that word used in a positive context. (laughs) (laughs) And 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 quite honestly, uh, you know, my goal in life is to perturb the system. So Uh I'm quite good with using a word that kind of shakes people up a little Uh bit. But I have chosen it because I've intentionally chosen that word because I do think it's the best description of it. And I think we push back against seduction because we erroneously believe it's something that is done to somebody. Mm -hmm. But the reality of it is seduction requires um, an ability to receive. So nobody can seduce another without permission. Somebody cannot seduce me without me allowing, Mm -hmm. allowing them to, without giving them access to who I am. We have this belief that, you know, a guy can seduce a woman outside of her will. A guy might be able to overpower her outside of her will, but he cannot seduce her without her giving permission. A woman cannot seduce a man without his permission. So guys come in and say, well, I had an affair because she seduced me. Well, that means you let her. Mm-hmm. You know? and, and I don't think we bring that side of it into the word, that mm-hmm. it is both a give and a take. And to me, that's the important part of it, mm-hmm. is I, the superpower is my ability to draw, to woo, to draw you into intimate relationship with me. But the flip side of that is you have to allow me to seduce you. Yeah. You know, guys will joke about, you know, stepping out of the shower and dancing naked and it does nothing for their wives, Mm -hmm. you know, because she doesn't allow that to be seductive. It's it just doesn't strike her Mm -hmm. well. And I'm not saying that she needs to, but what can she learn what does draw her heart, what does seduce her, and hand that to her husband. So her husband can seduce her, can create a space that she wants to step into. Yeah. And I think part of my pushback as I'm thinking about it is I don't want to give up power, you know, to be seduced. You almost have like the images of like Delilah seducing Samson or like where you lose. allowed it. Yeah, but you lose all reasoning. Maybe you lose boundaries. Uh And so often the narrative of seduction is the person has a nefarious purpose. Right. And if the person we're in an intimate relationship with has a nefarious purpose, maybe we need to reconsider whether we should be in that relationship. You know, yeah. maybe they're not a safe person to be seduced by. Mm-hmm. Or maybe we need to create enough of a distance and a barrier that we can be safe while they grow up. Mm-hmm. But most of us marry somebody who at their core has a really good heart, Mm -hmm. just really bad skill. Yeah. And so how can I draw you into that space? You know, Mm -hmm. I I tell couples that 
you met and you continued dating because you were seductive to each other. Mm-hmm. There was something about you that I wanted to know more of. I wanted to be with more. You drew me into the space that I wanted to share with you. And I drew you into that. We were our best selves for each other. Mm-hmm. And then shortly after the wedding, we look and go, yeah, this is what you got. Deal yeah. with it. And yeah. we stop being our best self. Mm. There's something inherently wrong with that. This is the most cherished person in our life. Why do I not show up and be my best for them? Mm-hmm. Let everybody else have the dregs. Yeah. I am my best with you. I'm not fake with you. I am my true best self with you. That's seductive. Mm-hmm. You know, that is that is truly being loving and caring and cherishing you. That is being strong for you and protecting you. That is that is fighting for you. That's adoring you. All of those are seductive traits. So it's wooing. It is very much wooing. Mm-hmm. It's being my best self and in creating space that you want to step into mm-hmm. and, and join me in. Now, why is that so important where there's frustration or conflict in the sexual relationship? Because often when there's frustration or conflict, I'm either demanding something of self that's not real. I'm demanding that I physically respond in a way that my body's not able to. You know, a wife might be demanding that she experience an arousal and orgasm just as quickly as her husband does. Well, I'm sorry, her body and brain is likely not going to do that. Mm -hmm. Or he's demanding that she respond the way he wants her to. He wants her to have an initiating desire because he thinks that's right and she's wired to have receptive desire. And so when we start wanting something from the other and demanding it, we're no longer seductive. We mm-hmm. moved into an aggressive or a defensive or an attacking stance. That is way not seductive. Versus stepping back, being curious about who you are and being seductive to create space and invite you into it, to invite you to join with me. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's the space that true intimacy and in sex happens. Um, yeah, a couple can get have great arousal and maybe great orgasms outside of that space, mm. but that's not intimate sex. Mm. That's functional sex. And it can feel good for a time, mm-hmm. but what we've been invited to, what we are created with the ability to, where marriage truly thrives is in that intimate space. Mm. I like to say that, and this will... Hang with me because it's it's a tough statement to hear to start with. I think Christ was profoundly seductive. Mm-hmm. And an example of that is the woman at the well. So here he sits at the well alone in Jewish clothing. And the Samaritan woman comes up in the heat of the day, and there's lots been written why she would have done that. She was probably not well accepted in society. And he engages a conversation with her, which totally surprised her. You know, he thinks I'm beneath him. Why would he do this? And then he points out the depth of her sin. Mm-hmm. You're right. Mm-hmm. You've been married five times, and the person you're living with is not, you're not married to. That is really not okay in this society. And yet, look at her response. She continues to engage with him, and then she goes and brings the entire community to meet this guy. How did he say, You're living in sin in a way that was so inviting to her? Wow. That she saw him as somebody that she wanted to maintain relationship with, that she wanted to bring others to meet him. And I think how invitational Christ was, mm-hmm. how seductive he was in creating space that people wanted to be in. If I could have a time machine, my friends laugh at this, but if I had a time machine, I would like to go back to dinner with Zacchaeus. <laughs> All the things in, in history, I want to be a fly on the wall. What was the conversation I do not believe Christ was pointing out all of his sin. I think Christ was the person who stood on the road and looked up at him and went, hey, you, come on, I want to go to your house. Yeah. And and I think Christ was profoundly invitational, profoundly seductive to Zacchaeus such that Zacchaeus wanted to revolutionize his life. Mm -hmm. How do I be that with those around me? How do I especially be that with my spouse? Mm -hmm. That takes an ability that goes beyond who I am as a human. I fail at that all the time in my marriage. But I think that's the goal. How do I be so seductive that she wants to be with me? Mm -hmm. That she wants to engage deeper in relationship with me? Mm -hmm. And that when she's not, how do I still be that? Yeah. And if she isn't, how do I be that? You know, if I'm not, how does she be that? So that we get drawn back into that same space. Mm-hmm. So how do I be my best self? How do I be invitational? Right. And even the nuance with your particular spouse, 
what would draw her in? Exactly. And, you know, what's fun is sitting in counseling office and looking at a wife and saying, do you know what seduces your spouse? Mm -hmm. And most wives go, yeah, it's not that tough. And the guys go, no, it's really not. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. She knows how. And then I look at a husband and I say, do you know what seduces your wife? And they go, um, <laughs> yeah, actually, no, I don't have a clue. And what's really profound is when I look at the wife and say, what seduces you? Mm -hmm. And she sits there for a minute and she says, I don't know. Mm -hmm. And I think, yeah, we just revealed a problem. Yeah. So where would you like for your spouse to be able to touch your heart? Mm -hmm. Where would you allow him to touch your heart? You know, mm -hmm. And when we really work down to it, I can tell you the most stereotypical one I hear, the most common one when women start to begin to figure it out, I call Papa Bear. Mm -hmm. um, that they'll say when he's... And they began to talk about a story of when he was a really good dad in the moment, and she was watching him. One mom said, you know, he came home from work, and he was tired, but I was exhausted with a toddler and a newborn. And he looked at me with compassion, and he said, you go lay on the couch. I got this. Yeah. And he sat down on the floor, and she said, he's cradling the infant in one arm, and he's wrestling with the toddler with his other arm. He's protecting the infant and nurturing while he's playing with the toddler at the same time time on the floor, giving me space to rest. And she said, if I wasn't so tired, I'd have jumped his bones. <laughs> she said, that was so seductive to me. Yeah. And realizing what does touch your heart, nurturing it and growing it and pinpointing it. Mm -hmm. And then you're right, being willing to hand to our spouse, which means handing off some power and yeah. being willing to allow my spouse to touch the deepest core mm -hmm. of who I am, mm -hmm. which I think is what Christ invites us to do. Yeah. Be surrendered. Mm -hmm. Allow people to deeply impact you in those intimate spaces. Yeah, it's terrifying. And yeah, our spouse is going to screw it up often. Mm -hmm. But if I believe in them and where we're going, we can get there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I resonate with the Papa Bear thing. Do yeah, you? Uh -huh. Yeah, for sure. Like there's nothing more romantic than seeing my husband parent well. Yeah. Uh, and, and see, as a guy, that's so tough. I'd much yeah. rather, you know, if I just take off my shirt and you're seduced, that's easy. <laughs> you know? Yeah, you guys, What do you mean I have yeah. to figure out how to do this? Uh, you got to work a lot harder. Yeah, I'm sorry. That's, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, that's not fair. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. The last one is grace. Yeah. Um, being a person filled with grace. So when I first fell in love with doing marriage work, I did a couple of experiments. One mm -hmm. was to figure out what's at the core of male and female needs. And the other was what's the difference between these premarital couples and the couples that I'm working with that are in crisis. You know, mm -hmm. I was a young therapist. I didn't know much. And so I'm just trying to figure it out. And I kept asking questions and it came down to what I began to talk about is grace. Mm -hmm. And I developed an entire model of doing marriage therapy um, around grace. And it was kind of set aside when my major professor said, yeah, we're not going to research that. It's too complex. Mm -hmm. Let's research your other interest of sexual desire. That still is a foundation for me of experiencing and expressing grace in marriage. And grace is, you know, the common language is extending unmerited favor. I do not deserve grace from my wife. Mm -hmm. But when she extends it as a gift, it creates this profound healing space, a place where I believe in, in who you are, and I trust that you'll get there. I often point out to people, we do that naturally, generally, with our kids. Mm -hmm. Okay, you just did something that was really offensive or you did something that was really stupid. You know, you did really, but you're a kid. Yeah. And I believe in who you're going to become as an adult. So I'm going to extend grace for it. I'm going to allow that you are just being a kid. You're just being an adolescent who's acting out because that's an adolescent's job. Mm -hmm. You know, and you will grow out of it and you will be who I know you can be. That's profound grace. That's God looking at us and seeing the core of who we are. You are my child created in my image. Yeah, you, you've got this sinful aspect of you that my blood has covered. And I see the beauty in who you are as I look at you through the blood of my son. Mm -hmm. That is profound grace. How do I express that? And I see that happening in a couple of different ways. One of those is just that of acceptance. You are not going to be all of who I want you to be in a spouse. You know, mm -hmm. uh, how do I manage that? I wanted a spouse who was playful, and I got a spouse who was serious. Yeah. I wanted a spouse who would cuddle with me, and your ADHD is all get out, and you can't sit still for more than three seconds before 
you're off and running. I wanted to have a slow conversation over a cup of tea and you can't sit there for 60 seconds. Mm -hmm. Okay, asking you to not be ADHD is just not going to work. Now I'm critical and condemning of the core of who you are. How do I accept that there's beauty in who you are? And I feel, Michael, like that's the journey of maybe the the first five or seven years of marriage where you see <laughs> yes. a lot of couples reaching that five to seven year period right. and they just quit Yep. because I've realized you're not changing. Right. And now you have a fork in the road. Yep. Either you're going to accept the person for who they are right. or you're going to say... I didn't sign up for this. Yeah. I call it the terrible twos of marriage. I expand mm. it a little bit. I say three to eight. Mm-hmm. But yeah, it's right in that phrase where I look over. You know, I, I often tell the, I, I try not to tell many personal stories because being a sex therapist, that's not always wise. But this is an area that I do. I remember vividly a few months after getting married, laying there in bed and looking at my wife sleeping and thinking, who are you? Mm. What happened to this girl that I thought I was marrying? Mm. And it was only a couple months later that I remember laying in bed, looking at my wife sleeping. Do you see a theme here? And <laughs> and thinking, who am I? Mm. I thought I was going to be a good husband. I suck as a husband. I am no good at this. I, I'm bad at caring for you. Yeah. And when we real, and of course it was her fault. You know, mm. I'd be a good husband with anybody else. Yeah. <laughs> so when we accept that, wait, you're not who I wanted you to be. I'm not who I thought I would be in this marriage. Mm. And then the second part of grace to me is grief, which is in many respects the most profound aspect of grace, where I grieve that you're not who I wanted. You're mm. not all of what I wanted um, to be. That I will never be married to somebody who... If we go back to the ADHD couple, I will never be married to somebody who sits across from me, calm, attentive, and listening to me share my heart because mm. he's not capable of that. Yeah. And how do I grieve the loss of what I envisioned to be an important part of my marriage? Now, let me ask you, would you say that that grief needs to be private? Because I can imagine saying something like that to your spouse could be devastating. I think that's part of where we have to decide how intimate is our marriage going to be and how intimate can it be. Mm -hmm. Some spouses may not be able to handle that level of intimacy at a certain stage. Mm -hmm. Others, you know, if if we stick with that example, if he doesn't fully accept that he's ADHD and it has an impact Mm -hmm. to others, it's going to be hard for him to hear that she's having to grieve it. But if he accepts it and he has done his own grief work, You know, I'm never going to be able to do some jobs. I'm never Mm -hmm. going to be able to survive in some settings because, but I can thrive in others. Mm -hmm. In other arenas, I can do this better than anybody else because my brain processes information at a hyper speed. Mm -hmm. Well, once they've accepted and grieved themselves, they can allow their spouse to grieve but and they can hear it. that takes a lot of maturity. I mean, I'm thinking... Is that think- not what marriage is, though? I know, but I'm thinking about, for example, let's say there's a woman who is very overweight Uh huh. and she doesn't like the way she looks. Mm-hmm. Uh, and her husband says to her, I have to grieve having a wife with a beautiful figure. I mean, those words... For some women, she would never be able to get over that. If she can't, you're right. That needs to be an internal grief process. Mm -hmm. I don't think we grieve well alone. I don't think any change happens outside of relationship. So I do believe he needs trusted men Mm -hmm. in his life that he can grieve it with, Mm -hmm. that he can talk through it and he can share it. You know, if we've lost somebody close to us, we heal in that grief by telling stories of them, mm-hmm. by talking about how we wish they were in our life, how we wish we could have another cup of coffee with them, how we, w- and it's in the relationship with others that we are able to heal the loss of one. So mm-hmm. I think it needs to be shared with somebody. But if it's too painful for our spouse, no, don't mm-hmm. bring it in. Mm-hmm. I, I often say, don't throw up all over your spouse and just because you feel better leaving them. Where they're at that right. doesn't work yeah mm-hmm. the final aspect that i see in grace and there's probably way more than what i i see but is just believing the best in who you are mm-hmm. and all of these are intertwined like we said earlier going back to the person that i fell in love mm-hmm. with and who the core of you is and i choose to believe in that mm-hmm. um, and it may even be that i start to see the things that irritate me about you as the things that i love in you you know part of what i do in premarital is I want to know what drew you to each other. Mm. 
Well, what drew me to him is he is such a stable individual, and I am all over the board. And he says, what drew me to her is that she is full of life. And it's easy for me to be sedentary in life. Mm. Okay, I know where they're going to be struggling in 10 years. Mm -hmm. (laughs) You know, they're going to be in opposite camps. And and she is demanding that he join her at the party, and he is demanding that she stay home and let him be. So how do we go back to where I see the energy in you as beautiful, that is something that pushes me to be other than what I am. Mm-hmm. Um, and I see all aspects of you, most we can see, because I believe our weaknesses are our strengths overextended. Mm-hmm. So if I have identified a weakness in you, can I attend to the strengths? Karen gives me permission to use this example. Um, one of the things that I really love in somebody is persistence. You know, the staff jokes that I only hire feisty individuals. I, I hire people that are persistent. I'm a Dutchman, you know, mm-hmm. but other kind of people, you know, we set up earthen walls and we pump the water out so we can farm land that's below sea level. Who does that? Yeah. You know, move to a higher ground. Mm-hmm. Um, but we are persistent and I am going to reclaim this. One of the things that I really dislike in somebody is stubbornness. Mm. Well, what's wow. the difference between persistent and stubborn? You know, <laughs> they're when the my same wife, thing. <laughs> they're not, though. You know, when I when I look at my wife and she's persistent, I love that. When she's stubborn, I don't like her. Now she says the difference is whether I agree or disagree with what she's doing. You know, it's got to be way more complex. I don't think than that. so. I don't That's think what so. She says, and she's probably right. <laughs> yeah. Which emphasizes the point. I mm. get to choose. Do I see her as being stubborn because I'm not going to like her? Yeah. Or I can step back and go. Oh, yeah, Mm. there's that persistence I love in her. I hate that she's doing it in an arena that I don't like, but I love that she's persistent. Mm. Now I'm extending grace and I'm loving her. Mm. And I choose. I want to say it's about her. If she would just go the direction I want her to go, we'd be good. Mm. But the reality of it is I choose whether I extend grace or not. Yeah. And when I extend grace and see what she's doing as persistence, yeah, I like that girl. Yeah. That's who I married. That's what attracted me to her. Mm-hmm. Now yeah. I'm loving her. Boy, that reminds me of a story I recently heard where a woman was saying, my husband just isn't that interested in sex. Like, uh-huh. I always have to initiate. And the more I talked to her, the more she said, you know, he's cuddly. He kisses me. Uh-huh. You know, he loves just hand-holding. and. Uh-huh. And I'm thinking, do you know how many women would love to have a husband who... <laughs> would give significant parts of their body right? for a husband like yes. that. Yes, uh, uh-huh. but just, you know, we're always aware of what's right. lacking right? instead of what's present. And grace focuses in on what is there and what I mm-hmm. do love and attends to that, mm-hmm. grieves what is not. Yeah. So it's not saying I accept what is not. You know, mm-hmm. it, it, there is a type of acceptance, but I I grieve it yeah. and I let go of it. So I can truly celebrate who you are. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. grieving is a time limited process. It doesn't mean yeah that you hang on to that for the rest of your life because yes and no. I do think that there are you know if I grieve an aspect of my spouse and I truly let go of it. There may be five years from now, 20 years from now, somebody show up in small group Mm -hmm. that has that quality Mm -hmm. and is attractive to me and may spark that old grief. But if I've truly grieved it, I look at it and go, wow, it would have been nice to be married to somebody like you. I wanted that. Mm -hmm. But I no longer have the urge. They're not a draw to me. Mm -hmm. They're not a temptation to me because I've truly grieved it. Yeah. But to say, I, I wouldn't want to say that it's gone and I never no. hunger for it again, mm-hmm. but there's a closure to it. It's never going to be a part yeah. of my life. And what I mean by it's not ongoing is there are some people who really would take the posture of grief and become victims of that. Yeah, that doesn't work. Mm-hmm. That That's not grief. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, agreed. That's not acceptance. That, you know, if God did that with us, we'd be in a world of hurt. Oh, yeah, we would. Instead, he says, no, I make it as if it never happened. I remove it as far as the east is from the west. It's buried in the bottom of the ocean. It's it's not present in our relationship. Mm-hmm. You know, that's the goal. That's how do I be that? That's a superpower. Mm-hmm. You know, that you know, requires Christ in me. And as I was processing some of this, you know, I had this thought. A lot of times we were like, God you know, make me a better lover, Mm -hmm. you know, like give me these qualities so that I can have a better sex life. When in reality, the reverse is actually happening. Uh You know, God will use the frustration of sexuality and or marriage to actually turn us into different kind of people. That is so irritating. 
<laughs> <laughs> I have a bumper sticker in my office that says discipleship sucks. And sorry if anybody's offended with that. But because I tell my clients, I don't enjoy the journey. Yeah. I love where he's going to get me. Mm-hmm. But this journey is just not fun. Yeah. I want people to be who I want them to be. Mm-hmm. I especially want my spouse to be who I yeah. want her to be. Mm-hmm. You know, just like she does for me. And And I agree with you. It's that discipleship process that refines it. But as we get there, one of my buddies, he's um, approaching 80 now, and and he's had a rough marriage because he, I would not want to be married to him. He's a mm-hmm. difficult individual. Mm-hmm. I love him to death, but he's a difficult individual. His wife is a saint. But he sat beside me and he said, we're at this stage in life where marriage is sweet. Mm-hmm. I love the marriage I have today with my bride. It is sweet being with her. Mm-hmm. And I think... I never thought I'd hear those words from you. Wow. You know, and it's been the discipleship journey of him continually bringing himself under Christ's leadership Mm. as his wife challenges and pokes the rough edges in him, that he surrenders those and he keeps working on it, that they're able to get to a place that is truly rich in their relationship. Well, there you have it. Curiosity, seduction, and grace. These probably are not what you had in mind when you first heard that word superpower. But these three things really do have the potential to transform your sexual relationship and even your marriage. And as you could probably tell, I was particularly intrigued by what Michael shared about being seductive. I think in our culture, we only understand seductive as a way of being sexually attracted to someone. But the way Michael talked about it, as though it was much more than that, intrigued me. How can we live invitationally? And I think that's something that we all can really consider to take into our relationships. If you'd like to learn more from Michael, you can visit his website, Intimate Marriages, and we've linked to that in our show notes. I've also included a link to the last interview I had with him, which is very insightful in talking about mismatched libidos and other sexual challenges within marriage. And we'll also be talking about this episode at our next week's Second Cup. So if you're a member, you want to make sure you sign up for that link in the link in our show notes as well. Let me give you a preview. Next week, I'll be joined by Kate and JJ Tomlin from a ministry called The Heart of Dating. And we're going to talk all about navigating some of the challenges of modern dating for Christians in our world today. You know, with a growing number of singles in our population, it feels like a very important conversation So I hope you'll join me for that. Well, thanks so much for being with me. And I look forward to having coffee with you next time on more Job with Julie.